Hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Tessier of Life After Mold, and today we're going to chat about the five most common mistakes that are made when treating mold illness on your own. Join me. Mistake number one, thinking that glutathione is necessary for everyone. You know, heck, I made this mistake even when first starting out 10 years ago. And the reality is that glutathione is not for everyone, and that's totally okay. And there are so many reasons for this, including negative reactions. We don't want someone to get worse on their way to getting better. It's not a good thing for you to experience. It really is um, bums people out to get worse on their way to get better. That aside, a lot of people have reactions to glutathione, and it can happen for a lot of reasons. And some of the reasons might be your detox pathways. Glutathione and what it does happens in that first phase of detox. Problem is, if you're pushing on it and getting it to do a lot of work, you're going to have a buildup. And that buildup of its products then have to go into phase two. And if for some reason your phase two is a little sluggish, could be because diet, could be because of genetics, you might have some stuff that's getting stuck there that's causing a really nasty reaction. So glutathione reactions can happen from that over overburdening of that phase one or pushing on it too hard and overburdening phase two and really slowing it down. We can also see people have negative reactions to the additives, of course. We have seen dysbiosis definitely happen for people, and we might see that because there might be some type of um, sulfur metabolizing gut bacteria that's making something that's irritating your gut from the sulfur and the glutathione. It could be because of the ingredients that are needed to make glutathione. And so when you break it down, there's an influx of those ingredients, including your glycine and your glutamine. Now, glycine and glutamine tend to be something that is really, they're really nutritive to the body, especially to the nervous system and to the gut. And so when we have someone who might be sensitive to those, you might see a lot of neurological stuff like headaches, insomnia, anxiety, like kind of overstimulation of the nervous system. That can happen with glutathione. We can even see folks that have too much gliotoxin making glutathione cause maybe too much of that, what we call intermediate metabolites, where the gliotoxin gets broken down a little bit or modified a little bit, and it becomes more toxic to someone. So pushing on glutathione when someone has really high levels of gliotoxin is definitely another thing that would make it look like you can't tolerate glutathione, right? And so each issue realistically has its own solution. Are you going to balance the gut? Are you going to pull back on giving someone glutathione? Are you going to support phase two detox? You know, whatever it may be, but some people just opt to give give people what we call precursors of glutathione. And so those are N-acetylcysteine, vitamin A, vitamin C, E, selenium, and zinc. We call those the ACEs plus zinc. And those can be really helpful. So that way your body can make glutathione on its own terms. That can be really helpful for folks too. So that mistake number one is thinking that glutathione is necessary for everyone. Mistake number two, and this one is super interesting, and this is mistaking mold illness for chronic infections. So let's say you've been mold exposed and and you've addressed the home and undergone treatment for a while, but you're still like fatigued and brain fogged and headachey and joint pain and muscle pain. You know, the, the reality here is that you may have stopped with your mold illness treatment a few months back, and it could be a chronic infection that your body is finally navigating and battling. So what we will sometimes see is mold and mycotoxins suppress folks' immune system. And as a result, there's infections don't get challenged. They kind of sit quietly in the body. And then soon as someone's immune system comes back online, that's an overstatement. I should say as soon as someone's immune system becomes a bit more functional, what can happen is the immune system just, uh, and it finds that infection and it, it goes after it. And as a result, you're getting this inflammation and pain and all these cytokines. It's the immune system like waking up to a chronic infection that's been hanging around. So if you've like undergone treatment and you're home safe and you're feeling that all of your mycotoxin testing is normalizing, but you're still having these symptoms, you need to look into chronic infections. So let's say if your fatigue is still kicking around, maybe you want to consider a workup for Epstein-Barr virus or a cytomegalovirus, those viruses that really are correlated with mono, right? If you have morning stiffness still after some of these chronic infections, maybe you want to consider like a Lyme and co-infection workup. The reality is that there are so many options when it comes 
comes to how to test for and navigate chronic infections. And so it's really important to work with a provider who's well-versed in their fields and kind of not only kind of tease out the symptoms and identify them from a complex case, but then also knows how to treat them or knows someone wonderful to refer you to to undergo that treatment. So that is the mistake number two of mistaking mold illness for chronic infections. The third mistake today is mistiming your binders. So for folks who are undergoing like toxic mycotoxin treatment, there can be a role for binders in your treatment. Of course, we want to get out of exposure, but we find that binders in the gut can be helpful to prevent that reabsorption as your body's moving it out through the blood, to the liver, to the bile, to the stool, and out the body. When we bring on binders, we just hold on to those toxins so that way they are carried out with your stool. So binders, as simple as they are, there's a little bit of kind of complexity to really maximize their benefit. And not only do we want to maximize their benefit, but we also want to prevent them from interfering with your treatment. So typically binders should be had before 30 minutes before a fat containing meal, right? And we also want to make sure that they have a little bit of fat in that meal or snack. So whether it's nuts or salad dressing, or we just want to make sure there's a bit of fat because that will stimulate the bile to be released from the gallbladder. So timing is important, but also we want to be sure about the timing when it comes to medications and supplements. And the reason here is that you are spending so much time and energy on supplements and medications and money too, that we want to make sure we're not wasting that money. And we want to make sure we're not wasting those supplements. So it's really important to take your binders away from your medications and supplements supplements typically by two hours. And so that way we are sure that the medications and supplements are doing their job, potentially life-saving medications that are keeping you safe, keeping your blood pressure down, what have you. And you're also doing the good work of allowing the binders to do their job. So the third mistake, again, is mistiming your binders. So mistake number four, mismanaging your unique dietary needs. So there is not a diet that is one size fits all. And in fact, there is not a diet for one person that might go throughout their lifetime. People's needs, their dietary needs are going to shift and flow depending on what is happening in their life, in their body at the moment. So our first kind of subtopic of this mismanaging your unique dietary needs is really, are you eating the food that's right for your needs in the moment? Are you like low in your B vitamins and you're not getting enough protein? B vitamins are huge for detox support? Are you eating foods that are intolerances or allergies that might be causing excessive inflammation that might be causing your body to have that like upward battle on top of everything it needs to do when addressing mold illness? Another dietary issue, for example, could be like, again, dysbiosis. Maybe your gut flora is also secreting toxins and causing issues in your gut and they're really getting fueled by the diet that you're having. You know, Do you need to incorporate more foods that are fermented with health the bacteria. Another option of your managing your own unique dietary needs is being aware of eating enough. I see this all the time. My clients will say, Lauren, I can't eat. I'm not really like, I have no appetite. You know, I, I don't get my hunger signals. I'm not enjoying food. And this is really twofold here. Are you eating enough to fuel your body? You need to eat in order to have recovery. And there are times where I much rather have someone eat excessive amounts of fruit because that's all they have a craving for at the moment than not eat at all. And so it's really important that people are consuming foods period, to aid in the recovery. And then there's like this little other part there that exists where at some point in this process, food can really become an enemy for folks. And I really get kind of like sad for people, but also understand that, again, it's causing that uphill battle when people aren't having their reward centers in their brain kind of stimulated. Sometimes they lose track of their dopamine and their feel-good hormones and things that really 
really can have a positive influence on their stress response that comes out of being ill. So this whole concept of, are you eating enough? It has food become an enemy for you. That's something I absolutely want to avoid for people because it's just, it makes things so much more difficult. And the other part with the, the not eating enough picture is when you are exposed to mold, you will develop a lot of issues around brain fog and fatigue, and you're not going to cook. You're not going to go shopping. You're not going to remember to make a list and plan and do all this. And so that can be really, really hard and add to that complexity of like not eating enough. And so that really falls under mismanaging of your unique dietary needs. 